to take these off and put the northern hemisphere continents together. Europe, but cut at the Urals, and North America, where are we? And Baffin, where are we? Good fits were obtained for the northern continents, North America, Greenland, and Europe. And once again, the geology matched across the, uh, the coastlines, or matched across the, the outlines of the continents. Once again, these outlines drawn at the 500 fathom contour. There's a mountain belt that we know in the eastern seaboard of North America as the Appalachians which runs over into Britain, Scotland, Norway, and touches the coast of Greenland. A continuous mountain belt right across all three pieces of this northern part of the jigsaw puzzle. Now, apart from the matching of the kind of strata, much of the evidence for the former union of the continents was paleontological. And one of the, um, that is, was based on fossils. And one of the main um, participants in the debate about continental drift, one of the main authorities on the, uh, the use of fossils in matching the continents is Dr. Colbert, who describes in this next piece of film his interest in the problem of continental drift and the union of the continents, or the evidence for the union of the continents based on fossils. For the last 10 or 20 years, a great deal of evidence, physical evidence particularly, has been accumulated to support the theory of continental drift. The theory that the continents as we now know them have drifted to their present positions from an original, from original positions which were far different. Now any theory to be viable must uh, satisfy all aspects of the theory. And for many years, quite a few years, a uh, good many paleontologists, people who study fossils, were not convinced by continental drift because they felt that it didn't explain the uh, distributions of fossils any more than the idea of fixed continents. And I certainly felt that way for a long time. But as the evidence accumulated, uh, there seemed to be more and more reason to believe in continental drift. There was a problem, though. If you can picture in your mind's eye the present arrangement of continents, you, you remember that there is a connection, a possible connection between Asia and North America in the Bering region. There's the Isthmus of Panama. Um, and of course, that connects all of those continents. And Australia is more or less connected. That is, there are shallow waters between Australia and uh, Asia. And so it was possible to think or to postulate that animals got from one continent to another, animals of the past, by these bridges. And it's a long way around, that's true. But when geological time is taken into account, that long way around isn't particularly crucial because if an animal spreads its range by a factor of, say, half a mile a year, in 20,000 years, it will spread across 10,000 miles, and that's almost nothing in geologic time. But Antarctica, it seemed to me, was a crucial uh, key in this whole problem because here was a completely isolated continent. Now, I had hoped for many years that perhaps fossils would be found on Antarctica, that is, fossils of land-living animals. If so, it seemed to me that would really clinch the paleontological evidence for continental drift. Well, in 1967, in December, a New Zealand geologist named Peter Barrett found this little piece of bone which just happened to come to me for identification. This happens to be a piece of a lower jaw of a big amphibian that lived in lower Triassic times. And here was a first clue that there might be uh, fossils on Antarctica, Antarctica that would have a bearing upon the position of that continent in lower Triassic times. On the basis of this bone, 
an expedition was organized to go to Antarctica to look primarily for fossils because this bone had been found uh, incidentally by a geologist who was working on other problems. Well, it so happened that uh, I went to Antarctica with several colleagues and we started collecting fossils and we found various pieces of bone almost immediately. Bones like this, bones like this, this happened to be a piece of a pelvis, but I wasn't able to completely identify these because they were not the uh, crucial parts of the animal, but on December 4th, 1969, a uh, date that I remember very well, this piece of bone was found. Now this happens to be a piece of a little skull, and here is a skull. Now if you look closely, I think you can see that this corresponds with this part of the skull. Here's this portion of the bone known as the maxilla. Here's a tooth. Here's a tooth. Now this is the skull of a reptile, a fossil reptile known as a dicynodont found in South Africa. This particular reptile is called Lystrosaurus. And here, for the first time, we had an indication that Lystrosaurus lived in Antarctica. I think the correspondence there is very close. So that was really the beginning of our good hard evidence as to the nature of the fossils in Antarctica. Well, subsequently, a lot of things were found. For example, here are the bones of a large Lystrosaurus, a shoulder blade, a leg bone, a piece of ribs, some foot bones that were found in Antarctica. And here is a specimen which it may be a little difficult to see. Nevertheless, this is a crucial specimen because here is a skull cut right down the middle by processes of erosion uh, of a Lystrosaurus of about this size. You see here, here is a tusk, here is the position of the eye, here is the back of the skull, here is the bottom, here is the top, and those correspond like that. So, to make a long story short, we found a great deal of, of material representing Lystrosaurus in Antarctica. Now, Lystrosaurus is a characteristic fossil of lower Triassic age found in South Africa, found also in India, found also in eastern China, and it lives along with various other reptiles that were contemporaneous with them. With it, for example, here is a little, a skull of a little reptile known as Procolophon from South Africa. In Antarctica, we found a skull of Procolophon, and I think, can you see those? I think it's quite obvious that those are very similar indeed. This skull has been smashed down. If it weren't smashed, it would be very close to the other one. We found a whole skeleton of this, and indeed we were able to reconstruct the skeleton of this little reptile from Antarctica, which can be seen in this drawing, and a skeleton from Africa seen in that drawing. And you see there's the evidence of animals that were almost the same living in Africa and Antarctica. Now animals like that were certainly land-living animals, see the feet, and they couldn't swim across great expanses of ocean, so I think this is good evidence that Antarctica was closely connected to Africa, and indeed that these animals represent individuals living in a single range, a range comparable, say, to eastern North America in aerial extent, which subsequently has become split apart by the drifting of Antarctica and Africa away each from the other. Um, so those are members of the Lystrosaurus fauna, as we call it, and there are various other reptiles also belonging to this association of animals. But the characteristic thing was Lystrosaurus, as shown by these bones and as shown by this restoration of Lystrosaurus. This shows what the animal looked like. And I think here again, you can see that here is an animal that Certainly it wasn't a swimming animal, although we have reason to think that it lived along the edges of rivers and streams. It was a very strange kind of a reptile. It had this sort of a beak-like front of the skull. It lived upon plants. The evidence is pretty good for that. And these animals are found by the thousands in South Africa. As I say, they're found in India, and we find abundant remains of them in Antarctica. So the discovery of all of this material